analytical tools to real data. Uh, it's too easy to cook up a model that makes everything easy for the theorist, but just doesn't teach you so much about an actual system and it's not really implementable. And it's difficult, it's very difficult to, to grapple with real data and do something useful with it. So I, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated the effort that, that goes into this direction. So um, this talk is um, one aspect, is about one aspect of the question of collective agency, uh, the, perhaps the most primitive aspect, the most basic aspect. For there to be a collective, the, the, the very minimal condition is that different entities coexist. So they at least should be able to coexist. And so this is a talk about coexistence that, that is based on, on work that uh, Onofrio and myself did with collaborators um, a couple of years ago. And uh, it's, it's not going to really answer the question for the workshop, but perhaps it's, it's interesting. I hope it can be interesting. Um, so the starting point is, is Malthusian growth. Right, so uh, let's start with just two quotes here. Uh, the first is by Malthus himself, and it's really the, the fundamental idea in his essay, and it says population, when unchecked, increases in a geometrical fashion, which is another way of saying exponential growth. And Malthus was perhaps the first to realize that exponential growth is, is pathological, is a catastrophe. Uh, it's not like other forms of growth. It's really different than other forms of growth. So he had that realization and was particularly worried about its consequences for the food, for the food system, uh, as we know. And um, I mean, this has had a life of its own, but really uh, one of the major impacts of, of that realization was uh, that it prompted Darwin to, to think about natural selection, it kind of provided a, a window into natural selection. And he says it himself in his autobiography. He really got it, he got the idea reading Malthus. Um, and so he, he said that, I'm just going to read this so that we, we're all on the same page. I, I happened to read for amusement Malthus on population and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence. I mean, he had done the trip, as we know, and observed for so many years. It at once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. So it really um, kind of stems from Malthusian growth. Uh, the theory of evolution has its roots historically and conceptually in the notion of exponential growth. Uh, so um, this idea of natural selection that he got while reading uh, Malthus is really uh, indeed a simple mathematical fact about exponentials, um, which we can, be, we can summarize in this way. If you have n populations that are growing exponentially at different rates, uh, population i, and they're all growing at rates ri, the population with the largest growth rate um, will eventually dominate, no matter what, particularly no matter what the distribution of initial conditions. So if you look at, as I'm showing here, um, if you look at the, the relative fraction of the population with the maximal growth rate to every other population, however many populations there are, it's always going to converge to one, it's going to dominate the population. Everything else is going to be negligible eventually to that one. And it doesn't matter if it starts very small. So that's the key point. You can start very small, but if you have a better fitness, now we call that fitness, that quantity fitness, you're going to dominate. So this is really a property, a mathematical property of exponentials that that's what he got, that's what Darwin understood, and so he understood that it was a, a sort of uh, an engine for, for adaptation. Uh, and so here, paying respects to the, the, the work that we heard about on ants, I, I just took this one example where a single queen can generate a colony which then expands. Um, and so this is an example for the Argentinian ants which are now colonizing the whole world and are now particularly present in the Mediterranean. And so uh, this is just sort of a, a fun illustration of the notion. It doesn't matter how, with how many entities you start. If they have fitness, they can dominate. <clears throat> um, so, of course, this version of natural selection is very primitive because it doesn't account for interactions, it doesn't account for population control of any forms, and so ecological theory um, is based on, on this idea plus other ingredients. Um, and one framework for adding these other components is um, the, the Lotka-Volterra model, in which you had two, two different uh, 
ingredients on top of exponential growth. Um, how does this work? I haven't even tried to use it. Okay. So I just wanted to point the one that points. Doesn't point. Okay. Well, I'm gonna do like people, you know, just just point. Um, <clears throat> Right, so um, adding two, two ingredients to exponential growth. Exponential growth is still here in this model where you describe the dynamics of different populations, uh, but you add uh, logistic saturation. You say, okay, no, but uh, there is gonna be a maximal size for a population in a given environment. So that's form of environmental constraint. Call this carrying capacity and add this, this term here, such that by itself a population will grow exponentially uh, when this is negligible, but eventually will saturate to the carrying capacity. So this is the logistic growth. And then you, you, you add interactions. And in the simplest version that is amenable to mathematical analysis, you couple populations pairwise with a, a, an interaction strength that you take as random. So this is the simplest version of the lotka volterra model. So random, I mean every uh, interaction strength for a pair is a normal variate with a given mean mu and a given dispersion uh, sigma. Now, this is a model that's been analyzed uh, by, by many people. One thing you find is there is a, a stability condition. So the possibility of an equilibrium state where multiple populations coexist, stably, meaning stably with respect to small, small perturbations, places a constraint on the, the sort of strength and dispersion of the interactions, but also, importantly, on the number of species that can coexist. So th this is an inequality that says that you cannot have too many species interacting in this way and them being stable. So it's a different, more complex version of uh, the kind of instability that Darwin uh, pointed at, but, um, but it's still there. So the point is, in the presence of this regulation factor, that regulation factor, here I'm, I'm assuming competitive interactions, so you would think that populations would control themselves because the coefficients here are positive. Um, still, it's, it's not easy to find stable equilibria. In particular, you cannot have uh, very diverse equilibria in, in this setting. Um, there is a version of this argument that is even more general that doesn't refer to any one particular model. Um, and it's based on um, random, matri random matrix theory. Uh, it's due to Robert May. And it's, it's based on the, the, the way the eigenvalues of random matrices scale with the size of the matrix. Re the, uh, eigenvalues are relevant because they control the linear stability of a dynamical system. And so um, I'm happy to go into details, but perhaps this is not the place for uh, too many details. I just wanna say that there is a general version of the argument uh, that too many species cannot coexist um, in, in, sort of in a way that doesn't seem to depend on very much. So what this is saying is you start from the Darwinian instability. You try and add those factors that could regulate populations, either explicitly in a model like Lotka Volterra or more abstractly, just talking about random interactions, you always come to the same conclusion that there is an upper bound on the number of species that can coexist. Do you want to say something about this model not being very fundamental? I mean, they're in wide use, of course, but they're just phenomenological models of populations. They make no reference to energy or information or the fundamental things in biology, and therefore they may not it sounds like Follow. you want to say something about it. Um, yeah, well, but uh, I know what I would say about it. I'm asking you what you would say about it. I agree with you. Okay. I completely agree with you. Uh, but they, they do point to something, these models, it seems to me, and that something is, uh, and this is the sort of the theme of this talk, exponential growth is pathological, it's unstable intrinsically, and it's very hard to tame. You can try and add all these components and try and make it work in a way that allows for coexistence and still, uh, it kind of feels. So this is the perspective that I take. Please. Thank you. Is your upper bound, um, does it, is that when a, in a well-mixed population, is that a point in space? It's not, or is, does it also hold if you have a spatial model? 
Uh, oh, things get get more complicated. This is really about the the well mixed interaction of right. multiple populations. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's a great point. I mean, of course, things get more complex. But this is really, those are simple models that kind of show uh, a, a conundrum, a difficulty, uh, I think, which is reconciling exponential growth and uh, sort of stable coexistence. So this, this uh, result by May uh, gave birth to a slogan, uh, which was the title of one, one of the versions of, of this paper which is that complexity, and here complexity refers to uh, how diverse interactions are, but also how many species are put together in interaction, begets instability. Uh, so that slogan really uh, is famous, but it is, is counterintuitive, and it clashes with empirical observation in, in obvious ways. Um, it is not the case that more diverse ecosystems, uh, at least uh, globally, are unstable by necessity. Uh, oftentimes, they, they look more stable in terms of population dynamics, in terms of um, invasion, extinctions, cycling behavior, and all these things, than, than simpler ecosystems that have fewer species uh, and uh, that are prone to these instabilities. And so this was formulated in, in one version by, by Elton in the 50s, saying simple communities are more easily upset than richer ones, not the other way around. And so they are more subject to destructive oscillations in populations, more vulnerable to, to invasions, and so on. So in ecology, we have, we have this debate. Uh, which one is correct, right? More species, more diversity, more complexity. Is that the stabilizing force, like empirical observation would seem to suggest? Or is it not based on arguments that go back to May and Darwin book before that? Although I'm not saying that Darwin said that complexity begets instability, but he just um, kind of embraced exponential growth. Let me put it this way. And uh, I mean, he had good success, obviously, doing that, but there are, there are limitations to this approach. Um, so moving on. Um, we've just seen that both evolutionary dynamics and ecological theory are rooted in this assumption of exponential growth. And indeed, it is the simplest kind of growth you can think of because it is very scale invariant. The rate of growth of a population simply does not change uh, with its size. It's always the same. But it is a, a relevant question, it seems to me, to ask uh, how much empirical support is there for exponential growth? Um, and so uh, I don't have data to show here the kind of support that we do have, which involves typically bacterial colonies, um, and, and sort of simple lab systems of the sort. But the, the data I have here that I can show is, um, has been compiled by many authors, but really in, in the past decade have been brought together by Ian, Ian Hatton, who is an ecologist who has focused on gathering this growth data and um, generating uh, insight, I would say, out of this data. So here showing uh, growth data at different levels of organization. Because this idea that um, biological populations uh, interact is, is meaningful at multiple levels, not just the ecological level. In fact, if you think of a single organism as a population of cells, uh, you can think of um, a colony for social insects as a population of individuals, and a community as a population, as, as made of populations themselves. OK, so considering these different levels, uh, and, and gathering data for, from multiple sources. So these are plots that are not uh, single paper plots. They are meta-analyses that, that bring together multiple sources, but that show across a spectrum of sizes. So um, the mass of an individual body here as it grows, um, the mass of uh, the body as it reproduces, so it's a different kind of growth. So this is the, the growth of the body, called ontogeny. This is the reproductive growth, so creating new bodies. And this is the size of colonies, like uh, ant colonies and other social insects. And what you see is on this log-log uh, representation, there is obviously a relationship between the growth that is generated by a given amount of biomass, but that uh, relationship is not linear. If you look at the, the, the scaling exponents that come out here, they seem to be uh, consistently smaller than one, uh, closer to 
0.7 or 3 quarters. And it seems to be the same exponent at the ontogenetic level, reproduction, colony level, and strikingly also at even higher levels of organizations. So this is data that was assembled and published um, in a paper in 2015 that looks now at the production, so the, the production of new biomass from entire communities. And those communities involve uh, very different types, uh, mammals, herbivores, say, fish, uh, trees, uh, even marine bacteria. So very different kinds of communities. But so what you see here is over six orders of magnitudes of biomass density, you again find production scaling that is consistently sublinear. So here we are seeing all the data put together in one plot with fits. And here you see the distribution of uh, exponents that are fitted across these different kinds of communities. And so uh, if this is one and this is three quarters, you find almost everywhere fitted exponents that are below one, compatible with a kind of uh, production that is sublinear in the size of the community. The, the scaling exponent appears to be close to three quarters. Same value, by the way, um, at the colony, individual, and ontogenetic uh, level. Uh, on the y-axis, you don't have growth rate. You have growth per day, right? It's not the RIs of the previous slides that you were plotting on the y-axis. Is that right? Um, it's the quantity of biomass that is added to the community per unit time, per day, say. Per day. So that's, that's not RI. That's, uh, it, it, is, like, it, it, is, it is RI. No, RI is um, the exponential growth rate. So it's the, it's the ratio, right? It's, it's, it's uh, the amount of uh, mass that is added per so, unit colony size yes. per unit time. Yeah, so, um, so suppose you have a community with a given mass, biomass or biomass density, biomass per uh, square kilometer, something like this. Uh, how much new biomass does this community produce per unit time, delta M? Yeah? And so um, this is the relationship that we are looking at. How much new biomass is added given that it has a given biomass, right? So uh, in the exponential case, delta M um, is just uh, R M delta T. Right. Right? So it's, it's that thing. Yes. But now, so the, the point is, per capita or per unit mass, you have a constant in the exponential case. Now I'm not saying it's a constant. In fact, it's not a constant. In fact, in, in this more general case, you have something more like uh, there's an exponent. Okay, got yeah? it, yeah. And you might have an R here as well. Fine, but, thank you. But that's the point. The point is right. per capita production or per kilogram of biomass production is not constant. Decreases. It decreases as you have more biomass density. Now, this is an empirical observation, and I'm not claiming that anybody knows why that's happening, but I think it's fair to say that it is happening, and it is happening at multiple levels very consistently in a way that calls for our attention. So let's say we uh, take this in and, and take it seriously and see what kind of mathematical consequences follow from working with sublinear production rather than linear production. So sublinear means this. And so in terms of the relationship between production and, and mass, it's, it's less than linear. But in terms of the dynamics over time, it means sub-exponential. So I often confuse sublinear with sub-exponential because over time, it's sub-exponential growth. But in terms of the relationship between production rate and, and mass, then it's uh, sublinear. I hope that's clear. Um, OK. So let's go back to uh, the mathematics of uh, natural selection that we talked about previously. We said in the exponential case, the population that has the largest growth rate will come to dominate. Now, let's just repeat this, this calculation in the case where every population grows sublinearly, 
rather than linearly, meaning there is an exponent here, k, that is smaller than 1, whereas in the exponential case, k would be 1. If you do that, you find that uh, every single population compared to the, sort of the, the, the proportion of the one population to the entire group asymptotically over time converges to, to a constant, but that constant is always smaller than 1. There is no one population that can dominate simply because it has a larger growth rate. So if you have a distribution of rates in this sense here, in the sense of this coefficient, having the largest r does not imply uh, uh, sort of eventual dominance. Instead, it means you have a bigger, you represent, eventually you represent a bigger fraction of what's out there, but not in a way that is exclusive. So to my knowledge, this observation that sublinear growth leads to, uh, or rather does not lead to competitive exclusion, was first made very clearly by Seth Murray in the context of chemistry, context of uh, molecular replicators. Um, so those growth laws uh, emerge in this context very naturally, and he called it the survival of everybody, and indeed that's exactly what's happening. Sub-exponential growth is shown to lead to coexistence invariably. Um, and I think that's, that's the sort of fundamental post-Darwinian insight here. Um, now, what we did with Onofrio and, and collaborators is to reconsider uh, ecological Mateo, models of competition. Can yes. I ask, say, something about the exponential versus sublinear growth? So the way you are presented it is that you are sort of present them as uh, two alternatives, which are like a sort of, of equal, uh, that are two among the many functional forms you can imagine, right? But the way, um, let's say, population biologists understand exponential growth is that it is in some sense something that is much simpler, that is simpler than any other possibility because as you wrote there, it assumes that individual reproduce independently, right? So it's yeah. somewhat population biology in absence of ecology, right? While in order to get, for instance, sub, uh, sub, yeah, sub linear, uh, sub exponential growth, what you need is to invoke some mechanisms, which you cannot, you can even in principle not describe explicitly, but there must be some mechanism which make in theory individual not reproduce independently, but reproduce dependently of what is the context, right? So it's, it's in, in some sense, there is something else that needs to happen. So when you, when you show the populations that grow uh, sub-exponentially or the, the colony that grows sub-exponentially, it means that there is something else. So an ecological interaction, some level of regulation in a colony, uh, limiting resources, that determines the fact that it's non, uh, not exponential. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not as simple uh, and um, definitely begs for an explanation. I completely agree with this. Um, mathematically, it's equally simple. Uh, biologically, it's not. It has a form of scale invariance as well. So, the, but it's just a different kind, a sort of less intuitive, less straightforward form of scale invariance. The scale invariance of exponential growth is the statement that you double the population, you double the production. Um, and so uh, th that is the simplest form of scale invariance. This is also scale invariance, but you, you can see it's a power law function, but one that calls for some form of self-regulation that is not accounted for, that is not explained, um, and I cannot explain it. So I completely agree with that, that caveat. Um, when we add um, the carrying capacity to an ecological model, it's another way of adding some interactions, self-self-regulation that we don't really explain just because it helps. So from that perspective, it's not worse. From the fundamental perspective, it's, it's, uh, it's a question. I completely agree. So what we did in this paper with uh, Onofrio was to uh, go back to the classical lotka volterra model, simply replacing logistic population control with sublinear growth. Um, so uh, on the face of it, uh, it doesn't look like a big difference. Um, 
the, sort of the, the growth of populations uh, in, in the two cases are less than exponential. In the one case, it fully saturates. In the other, it does not fully saturate, but it still has diminishing returns. Um, and so um, it's not obvious that those systems, those interacting systems, should have different dynamics on the basis of the simple modification of the single population uh, growth term. But what we found was, in fact, it makes a huge difference in terms of the role of diversity in impacting stability. So I told you about the May class of results that states that the more diversity, the less stability you can find. So in the, in the blue classical model, this is what you can see as a function of the number of species, the probability that the system will have a stable equilibrium goes down. And too many species, too much complexity implies instability. So what we find in this model is the opposite behavior. More species, more stability. <clears throat> uh, in terms of the, the, we can go into the mathematics of why that happens if you like, but the point is um, there is a major structural change in the dynamics of interacting communities on the basis of how they self-regulate. Uh, and the, the conventional, the now conventional wisdom that complexity begets instability is flipped on its head. Um, I'm going to sk skip this part. Uh, again, if there are questions about how that works mathematically, I'm happy to go into the details. But uh, to keep the discussion more general, um, I'm just going to give you this generalization. Uh, uh, one question that people have asked us is, um, what is it, in this context of looking at a group of populations that are interacting competitively, what is it about sublinear growth that really makes it more stable? Uh, and so we have another paper with Onofrio where we say it's not so much about sublinear. It's more something about the relative weight of self-regulation and cross-regulation. So this is a different model where populations um, self-regulate in the way that I said before. They have sublinear growth. And now they interact with different exponents. Um, and we find that what matters is the relationship between the self-regulation exponent k and the cross-regulation exponent a, which couples every one population to every other population. And so what we find is that um, if the exponent here is greater than the exponent there. The self-exponent is greater than the cross-exponent. Uh, you have May-type behavior, meaning uh, more species create less stability. But if the inequality is, is reversed between the exponent for self-regulation and the exponent for cross-regulation, then you get the opposite, the, the kind of behavior that we saw before, where more populations and greater creates uh, more stability. And in fact, to find stability, you need to have more populations than a minimum. Whereas in the classical May case, there is a maximum uh, number of populations. OK, so <clears throat> that's, that's all for the mathematical models. Uh, I just want to try and step back and, and tell you what it is that uh, my message is about today. Um, so. To make it very bold, um, evolutionary and ecological theory are rooted in Malthusian growth, both historically, conceptually, and mathematically. But uh, that hypothesis, at least empirically, does not appear to hold very well. If you look at different scales, different kinds of systems, different ecosystems globally uh, over the globe, what you find in the biggest meta-analyses that there are is a consistent pattern of sub-exponential growth. Something else is happening. Uh, now, within exponential growth, it's very difficult, as we know, there's this diversity stability paradox. It's very difficult to account for coexistence and stability. But it becomes really easy, kind of natural, as soon as you move away from exponential growth. Uh, and in a competition model that is similar to Lotka Volterra, but that simply makes that change, we find that indeed diversity begets stability. So, um, the lesson I take from this analysis is that when putting together multiple groups that interact and compete, uh, 
one thing that can be sort of critical for their uh, coexistence, their ability to coexist, is that they self-regulate in a way. So self-regulation turns out to be key for the stability of the, of the group. Uh, so what we have in those papers are mathematical models that illustrate this, this fact, but uh, if I wanted to, if, if I tried to give you sort of more general, more philosophical conclusion of this analysis and trying to go back to the topic of the workshop, I would say that uh, regulate yourself and the collective um, can, can follow. Now, to go back to Jacopo's point, um, what we need now is a theory of why that happens. And so that's very much open for the future, um, for future work. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. So, you know, um, there are circumstances when exponential growth um, manages to regulate everything, a diversity, to all grow exponentially at the same rate. For example, this is something that happens for chemicals inside a bacterial cell. There are thousands of chemicals, but a bacterial cell grows exponentially in its size and grows exponentially in the number of, in the population of each of its molecules. Is there evidence for that? Is there empirical evidence that it is exponential? There is empirical evidence for that. And there are theoretical models, which I can discuss with you, yep. uh, in which exponential growth is stable. It's an attractor of the dynamics. So, uh, you know, the transients are non-exponential, but it eventually settles down into an exponential growth in which all chemicals are growing exponentially at the same rate as the size of the system, thereby keeping the concentrations constant. But what's the mechanism? It's very interesting, and I would love to know more about this. this so data. the mechanism what's is... The, what's the mechanism for different rates, fluctuations in rates, to be smoothed out? So the mechanism is that the size of the system volume of the cell, of the protocell or cell, is a linear function or a homogeneous degree one function of the populations themselves. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, then you can, uh, you can see that there are these attractors. Okay, that's the, uh, okay, so we can discuss that. Yeah, that's very interesting, thank you. Uh, yeah, you first, and then I come there. Um, thank you. Very interesting work. I, I've read some of the papers that you guys have published on this. And a couple of points I think is really you know, interesting the way you are tackling on May's famous kind of a rule, so to speak. But a couple of concerns with that because we know that uh, it, it doesn't work. It's like, you know, a null model, which is at this point, very simple and simplistic. And since, 1990, since 1972, people have been working all the alternative where you can have, you know, a deviation from the random interactions that he supposed and including all the kind of interactions. And even, I mean, Joel Cohen showed that the stochastic version of that model shows that the conclusions are wrong. So I wouldn't use that as a, as a standard, you know, just a, a, a caution note. For that, and the other, the other thing is that um, there are many ways you can actually get sublinearity that um, um, that might be related to completely different processes. You know, and it's so it's like it might be sublinear growth. It might be a, a good phenomenological approach to what we are seeing, but it's not. Uh, it's not. It cannot claim that there is a, a sort of a, um, ontological, you know? Because uh, I can claim that there are many fitness equalizing mechanisms that will give you coexistence. And if you just uh, go back to Van Balen, for example, and the Red Queen, and what is implying there is this sort of uh, fitness equalizing mechanisms and trade-off that will give you this kind of Red Queen dynamics and coexistence. So, um, we can talk more later, but uh, there is, um, um, as, as uh, Jacopo pointed out too, 
uh, we need to, to have good mechanisms to actually see how these dynamics can emerge. We do, absolutely. And, yeah, and why we have the scalings too. Because um, is the scaling a byproduct of the, the, are you claiming that metabolic theory is right, that gives you the scalings and that gives you the sublinear stuff, or how this interacts with, you know, what is the precise route that causality flows through this kind of stuff? We don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, yeah. It's, it's a fundamental question, certainly. Thank yeah, you. Uh, there's Errol before. I just wanted to say, like, the comparison with maze, because all the mechanisms before this were just, just, were in a interesting ways extending the range in which you can be diverse, but still then trigger instability. So, for example, if you have different topologies, you have correlations, predator prey, or even not just predator prey, but in competition, some correlation you can shrink the, but still at a certain point you will have. So the, the comparison here is that the May's main idea that you increase diversity at a certain point, you trigger instability, was still there, and in this case, it's no longer there. That, that's, that was the reason, but of course, there are inf many, many interesting work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, um, that's very interesting. So I, I wanted to first say like one historical tidbit, and then I have a question. Please. The historical tidbit is uh, Baltus actually got the idea from Ben Franklin. Um, which I always like to tell my students because you know Ben Franklin also founded UPenn, so like you know our students like that. Fact. <laughs> so Franklin wrote a, and in fact it kind of connects to the topic here, uh, coexistence and collectives, because Franklin wrote a pamphlet in 1750, I believe, where he argued, he makes this argument where, uh, you know, the, America is such a virgin continent and it's like has the ideal conditions for you know the growth of you know man and. And he calculated that um, the, the white population of Americas, the English population of Americas, doubles every 25 years. And, and in, in 1750, he said that means that pretty soon there's going to be more Englishmen in America than in England. And, and he made an explicit political argument. The pamphlet was a political pamphlet, and he was making the argument that the English government should treat the colonists better because there's going to be more of them very, pretty soon. And of course, your point. So, so this whole co concept of Malthusian growth actually has like a political root. Um, and then Malthus actually cites Franklin for in, in his paper. Um, anyway. It's very interesting. So, yeah, so it's very, it, it, there's, a, there's kind of an interesting kind of socio-political uh, connection to Malthus, Malthus uh, where Malthus' argument came from and coexistence and sort of collective action in some ways. Um, okay, so on to the question. So, how does this sublinear growth um, square with, you know, because we actually know, like if you put like, and like this is like 1930s, right? Like Gauss's work, right? If you put, you know, permission, like in a culture, it grows logistically. Like you can show, you can, you can plot it, or like E. coli or whatever, you can plot those things in a culture and it's a perfect logistic curve. You can infer the, you can infer R, you can infer K, you know, and then if you, plot, if you put two of them to, together, you get like a very beautiful lot of water things. If you put like, you know, there's, there's experiments like um, Francisco Ayala and, I mean, there's a paper by Ayala and Gilpin, I think in 1973 or something, where they put like Drosophila in wilds at different densities and then look at sort of how the densities change. And you can fit, they actually have like some quadratic terms as well in the, they have some, some small like corrections to lot of water, but you can fit a, Lotka Walter equation pretty well to those things. So there's like a bunch of Lotka Walter has been kind of pretty well like tested in very controlled situations and seems to work. So how does that square with you yes. know sublinear growth? Is that is that compatible thank, with it or is it thank you for the yeah. question. Uh, Onofrio, can you perhaps answer that one? <coughs> You've looked at the data, at the time series data for multiple populations, and I think the answer is uh, overall not so compatible. Can you no, please comment? Yeah, on it? it's, I'm, I'm really an, uh, analyzing, yeah, more than 5,000 time series just to, for curiosity, because I didn't find actually uh, like reasonable, um, reasonable uh, indications of consistency of, of logis like of exactly uh, logistic growth, which exclude other kinds of growth, because they are really similar actually, these sigmoid, because you actually, right. For sake of, like, you, you have also self-regulation, uh, you have uh, 
n to the k minus n <coughs> instead of <coughs> n minus n squared. And basically, those, those can be, actually, if you fit a theta logistic model, you, you can have uh, many things. My, the indication over this, all these time series, I'm collecting a time series of isolates, <coughs> growing in, so species growing in isolation in batch cultures of uh, different kinds of phytoplankton and bacteria. And, and logistic is still consistent, but the, um, the, me, the median looks a bit, more, a bit less than, uh, than logistic. Still, it's exploratory, and I'm, I'm not already, I don't think I, I will be able with these two justify directly this observation which for with these, these models, which for now it's, as Matteo was saying, more indirect, looking at macroecological patterns, and so what if we right. consider that? But still, it's not so easy to, like you, you fit really well, because there are many parameters already, even in logistics, you have R, you have K, and um, you have also, um, <clears throat> you can have, if you add the a theta, if you use theta logistic, you have these three parameters, and they can really adjust well, and it's really not easy to. So it is not like you can say, ah, it's so logistic. The median, the sure. median theta is not one, correct? In, in those days, it's not one. It's less than one. It's less than it's, it's like you have, uh, like uh, like the exponent. Oh, okay. So so if it's theta is one, is logistic, and then you can have and then you can have uh, r here, and then you. With negative theta, you go in the sublinear, but also these, all these effects, as in the last slide, are, are true whenever, as soon as theta is less, uh, is less than one. But, but yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, but if, you, if theta is negative, that becomes, you have to switch sign as well, and that becomes the debt, so it's uh, minus the debt, and the first term is, is linear. You can actually do it like this, you can have a parameter, so the per capita, you can have alpha over theta, you define it like this. So when theta goes to zero, you have Gompers growth in the limit. When theta is negative, this becomes the death, which is linear, and this becomes the production, and you have that uh, theta is equal to k minus one. Are you talking of uh, individual strain, or are you talking of collection of strain? No, 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 individual, without, without look, looking at the interactions. And you're saying that the, the median theta is less? I'll show you the, the plus, it's less. It's still, logistic looks consistent. Indeed, I don't want to force my, like, um, it's still consistent, I would say, so it's, but it, the median, it's, uh, it's still there. But of course, I have limited yeah. but data for now. Would the same theory work, then, the question is, would the same theory work with, less, with something like logistic, but theta less than one? Yeah, yeah, he showed that in the last slide when he was showing the general thing, as, as soon as, as long, like, it was not exactly this, but even that, plus mass, mass action interaction, okay. As soon as theta is less than one, you are in the untime A regime. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but what if you're looking at the exponential space and the so-called exponential space? In which, uh, you know, there's a lot of material, a lot of food available to the E. coli cell, and uh, it's not getting into this, uh, it's far from the stationary phase. Yeah. Even there, you're saying it's not exponential, the growth is not exponential? It is. No, no, it is. Indeed, it, it I mean, I don't want to go against Matteo's story in the sense that you could have in some regime, like you still can have the diversity stability reversed and still have a phase when they are really, really scarce, they grow exponentially. You can put a threshold, we did that in the paper as well. Like you can have a threshold below which you say, okay, from this below, they, they yes, they grow exponentially and then from then on, they, they do not. And so you can also have that somehow, but... Uh, No, there are negative values as well in the. It's less than one. It, but but, but than it can be. Oh, yeah, yeah, it can also be less than zero in some cases. The median is. Uh, yeah, but the median is uh, is less than is less than one. Yeah. Yeah, in the data that I'm looking at now. Yeah. 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 It looks like it looks like that indeed. Like again, the strong indication for. Actually, like looking at it, are indirect because actually the macroecological data on production are, uh, yeah, are with a theta less than one. Uh, actually, in a, in a way, but yeah, sorry, I'm answering to the question. <laughs> no, no, you've you've looked at that yeah, data, yeah. that that single population. I data. can show you the the plots and and we can discuss more about this in general, of course. I have a um, different question <laughs> on uh, what you mean with self-regulation. In the sense that uh, 
it seems to me, and, and this is also related to the to the plots you showed about production and growth, right? That there are two different possible meanings or two two different uh, yes, two different meanings of uh, self-regulation. One is like, um, for instance, self-regulation in uh, ontogenic growth, where there is a regulation by an individual, an organism, a collective, not to grow as fast as it could as a function of their, uh, their, uh, their state. And I think this is like the sort of um, idea you are alluding to when you talk about self-regulation. Yes. And then there is how self-regulation is intended in uh, ecology, population biology, which is actually not self-regulation, but is regulation by availability of resources, right? We grow less because as we are growing as a function of our size, for instance, in a population, we have depleted resources and therefore we grow less, right? I, and this might be my bias, I cannot convince myself that these are uh, the same thing. I mean, I, I'm convinced that these are two profoundly different things, that one is the outcome of a program, an internal regulation, and the other is the outcome of the interactions with the environment, right? And so I wanted you to comment on whether you believe this distinction is true. And because this seems to me like also implies that the, the, what determines the sublinear growth when you look at uh, ontogenic growth is a profoundly different mechanism than what determines the sub sublinear growth when you look at a population, right? That yeah. There is, yeah. So I, I very much appreciate the distinction. I, I think it's completely relevant. Um, I, I, my sense is that what's going on is more the former than the latter in ways that remain mysterious. Um, so I remember when I first met uh, the main author uh, of, of this work, Ian Hatton, a long time ago, he, he was walking around at the Santa Fe Institute, by the way, asking constantly, why aren't there more lions? So that, that was his, his entry point into this kind of research. He was, he was collecting data in Africa, and uh, why aren't there more lions? So you look at these very lush environments where uh, it's obvious that there is no resource shortages. And, and you see uh, little activity uh, in ways that suggest that, at least for those mammals, the, the constraints on growth or the regulation of growth, at least in those environments, isn't really the, the availability of resources, but some other form of regulation. And so if that intuition is correct, uh, if it is true that mechanisms are similar across uh, levels of organization, then the one thing that seems to be common from the body, ontogenetic growth to the lions in the Serengeti, uh, is not that resources aren't available, but rather some sort of program, like you say. So I believe in the program, I don't have. I would say it's that, I think, but I just don't know how it works. But it's also kind of mysterious if you think about the regulation of, of, of bodies. Uh, even accounting for the self-regulation of ontogenetic growth through, through genes is, is not clear. So it looks like something like this occurs across levels of organizations. That would, that would be my guess. And I would like to understand it better. The key point of this is that it implies that the individual does not matter, right? That the individual does not represent a sort of natural scale for um, uh, totally. that's both it. regulation and, uh, and uh, that's exactly population the, biology. That's yeah. exactly the conclusion, exactly. You, you said it right. You said it right. If the individual matters, it's exponential by nature. Right? Yeah, so I agree. Maybe we can maybe keep on discuss uh, later, but let's have a coffee now. And we meet uh, when are we a bit uh, far? Like we meet in twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Sorry, I'm always asking you. But, uh, let's come back here so that we can start the group discussions.